Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Managing Finances Today and Tomorrow. I'm Geneve Viacres, Vice President and Director of Government Relations with One Main Financial, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's panel. Before I introduce our guest speakers, I just want to go through a couple of Zoom housekeeping items. First, we are recording today's presentation for anyone that's not able to join us live. We are in presentation mode right now, and we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions in the Q&A section at any time during the presentation. However, we're gonna wait until the very end to answer them. If the Q&A tab is not accessible to you for any reason, you can also email your questions to us at communityevents at omf.com. Today, we've assembled a panel of experts and partners from the nonprofit and corporate sectors to provide financial literacy materials that you can use to help manage your finances during these trying times. We also have a message from Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego and Arizona State Senator Kate Brophy McGee. Our panelists today include Allison Rapping, CEO of Arrowit, Brandy Smith, Program Manager at Arrowit, Mike Croxon, CEO of Consumer Education Services, and Joseph Millich, Senior Fraud Investigator with One Main Financial. During these trying times of uncertainty, managing personal finances can be challenging. In fact, nearly nine out of 10 Americans say that the COVID crisis has had an impact on their personal finances. So if you find yourself having the same feelings, know that you're not alone and there are resources to help. As a responsible lender in Arizona, One Main is committed to providing our customers and our communities with the financial literacy materials and resources to empower responsible and informed decision making. It is our hope that the materials and information shared today will help the greater Phoenix community to navigate the financial hardships as we face the COVID-19 crisis together and to manage your finances beyond the crisis as we move towards recovery. And with that, I now have the pleasure of turning your attention to our honored guest, Mayor Kate Gallego, for a special message. Wonderful. Thank you so much for convening to have this important discussion. We really appreciate you learning about what is available and, and thank you to the partners who put together this webinar because we know information is power, particularly as we fight the virus and we wanna come out of this a stronger community. The city of Phoenix is really trying to make fighting COVID a top priority and, and we are working with all of our residents in this difficult time. Testing has been a, a top priority for me and I'm very excited that tomorrow we will be dramatically expanding testing in the city of Phoenix in a partnership with FEMA, but staffed and, and paid for by the city of Phoenix as it's, it's been a hard week seeing uh, Arizona on the front page of national papers as being so behind in testing, but certainly been a priority of mine to, to do more in that area. And um, we will have major four major testing events with the city of Phoenix this weekend. We're also just trying to get financial assistance out to people in our community because we know so many people are unemployed right now. Uh, we've seen 80% declines in our hotel industry, one of our um, quite strong industries among others, and we know retail and other sectors are really struggling as well. Uh, the city has allocated millions of dollars to grants to help people pay their utility bills, that's like your electric or water bill, as well as rent or mortgage assistance, and we've partnered with a nonprofit wildfire to help us administer that program. Uh, we are also trying to make sure that food aid gets out and that people who might have health challenges have an opportunity to get food at home. Uh, we've partnered with the food banks, which are doing delivery. And then uh, we're right in the middle of a partnership with LISC and Local First Arizona, where if you actually want to help provide food aid, if you're a restaurant or event venue and you might be pivoting your business to provide more to-go service, you can apply for a grant right now. It closes on the 17th, so a very timely that, that we're meeting today. But we hope if, if you might, you know, for people who might have owned a large event hall where there's not ability to have large events now, but have a commercial kitchen, how great would it be to repurpose that to, to do home meal deliveries for people who 
are particularly at risk for the virus. So providing financial support in that area. We really are trying to get resources out to our small businesses and uh, phoenix.gov slash resources has a list of, of all of our programs. Uh, one I want to highlight is for micro entrepreneurs, five or fewer employees. We can do a, a grant to, um, of up to $5,000 to help you get through COVID. And, and we've, we've had some wonderful success stories, including some of my favorite restaurants. And, and uh, there was a great bakery highlighted in the newspaper this weekend. Makes you hungry just thinking about it. Uh, we also have a grants for small businesses, 25 or fewer of up to $10,000 that's available. Uh, one cool company was one that used to make toys uh, and climbing structures that we have at our public libraries and they have pivoted and are now making plastic structures that can protect doctors and nurses when they intubate COVID patients. So I hope good aid to help our small businesses get through what is a, a tough time for everyone. Uh, we really are trying to respond to the needs in our community. We've called more than 17,000 businesses just to ask them what's going on and, and how we can best help and, and tried to connect with great resources, including expertise on safety and, and financial management. So I hope that will reach some of you. Uh, we also have done grants and, and maybe having another round next month for our arts and culture organizations. March, when we had the, the beginnings of shutdown, was our prime season for arts and culture in Phoenix, and, and we want to help groups that protected public health by making changes in their performances or gallery spaces, uh, even fundraisers that, that couldn't go forward. Um, we are also very excited about working with our school districts to close the digital divide. I, I am a mother myself and have relied on the internet so often just to learn how to teach my son. I'm also very appreciative to teachers these days who do amazing work and uh, we can all appreciate better now that, that parents are doing it at, at home. Uh, we have now distributed hundreds of, of tablets with two years of Wi-Fi for our public housing residents and we're working with our school districts to stand up more hotspots and um, invest in more connectivity so that for families for whom digital learning makes more sense, they'll have the option to do it at home which is so key while we have high rates of, of COVID in our community. Uh, so uh, to, those are just a few of our programs, which we hope will make it a little bit easier. I'm grateful for everyone who's changed their lives, perhaps involuntarily to slow the spread of, of COVID in our community. And, and for any of you who may have experienced a loss, uh, we've lost far too many Arizonans uh, particularly in the last weeks and, and want to send my sympathies for, for those who are dealing with COVID in their family now or who have already experienced a loss. Um, so with that, we'll uh, turn it back to our hosts and thank you so much for, for having the mayor's office a partner on this important conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Gallego, for your words of encouragement and for your continued leadership and just for sharing all of the fantastic things that, that the community is doing to step up during this difficult time. Um, I now have the additional privilege of introducing our state senator, Kate Brophy McGee. Thank you very much, One Main, for your sponsorship of this webinar. I'd like to thank Mayor Kate for her efforts and her leadership in this regard. And I'd uh, like to say welcome to the webinar attendance. Uh, I am working in my capacity as a state legislator to implement and deliver the types of programming that Mayor Kate just outlined that she is doing on the city level. Uh, we have employment resources, we have uh, housing resources, more about that later. And we have EUA, Pandemic Unemployment and Unemployment Benefits. And many people and many constituents have had difficulty accessing those services. And so I have been working with the governor's office, uh, with my constituent services at the Senate, and with the agencies who are charged with uh, dispersing and putting these benefits in place. And by way of explanation, and certainly not an excuse, the 
I have been in the legislature since the Great Recession. And I saw great need, high unemployment, and it took us a very long time to climb out of the trough of the Great Recession, recover the jobs, recover the economy, and remembering how we went into the Great Recession and then watching how in March, in a matter of 30 days, we plummeted from one of the most prosperous states in the country uh, to a $1.5 billion deficit at the state level with our low unemployment, single digits, low single digits going to uh, 18, 19% in claims where our Department of Economic Services where unemployment benefits are delivered going from several thousand calls a week to 75 to 125,000 calls a day. Government doesn't do nimble well, and this certainly has, has been no exception. But connecting my constituents and connecting those who call my office to these services have been uh, my number one priority and the thing that I've been most busy uh, with. First of all, the pandemic unemployment assistance administered through the Department of Economic Security is national funding, typically $600 a week in unemployment assistance to those who have lost their jobs due to COVID or whose income and resources have been reduced. Uh, the law that passed in Congress very quickly mandated criteria that could not be built into our existing system. So what we did was contract with a software company. We built the system and we began dispersing those unemployment benefits in May. There was a delay in doing so. Additionally, the fraudsters got to work. On the national level, anybody who has ever been a victim of a breach, a data breach, the requirements of the federal law were thin enough. Name, address, social security number, the fraudsters would provide a bank account. Anybody could qualify, quote unquote, for benefits. And the fraud efforts and successful fraud efforts nationwide have been breathtaking. So we've had to put some safeguards in place to ensure that these valuable taxpayer dollars get to the people who need them. My advice to those who are looking for pandemic unemployment or unemployment assistance is to call your legislator, call your city council person if you live in the city of Phoenix, and uh, work through them to get to the benefits that you need. I am glad to report that my office has resolved almost every, every issue with my constituents. I don't know what it is like in other offices, so I would recommend that you do that, and I can provide one main financial with the website for that. In addition, if you are unemployed, you will qualify for access or Medicaid. And our Medicaid roles expanded by the hundreds of thousands over a period of about 60 days. That, but they have accommodated that volume. You, are, you can qualify for uh, Medicaid assistance. And if you need assistance with that, again, I believe One Main has the website and the contact information to put out to you webinar attendees. In regards to the home, uh, housing, rental, or utility assistance, uh, we are working with the Department of Housing. Uh, that, that is a situation where we have $127 million in funding from the feds and from the state to get out to those seeking rental assistance. A million of it has been dispersed, so it's gotten stuck in the system. I think the cities have some funds, the counties have some funds, and it's my understanding that in my district, which is in, encompasses the city of Phoenix in large part, 
that Wildfire has put together a program with providers, uh, and there are several providers, Foundation for Senior Living, Chicanos por la Causa, Lutheran Social Services, Neighborhood Ministries, Pilgrim Rest, St. Vincent de Paul, and Trellis, and the City of Phoenix Human Services. So my advice to uh, consumers who are seeking assistance on housing and utilities is to go local. Just call your city council person, call their office. You are also welcome to call my office and I can put you in touch with them. This has been an unprecedented and difficult time for Arizonans and for Americans and really for the world. Uh, I, we've never experienced anything like this in our lives. I'm so glad to see that uh, Mayor Kate has moved us forward on testing. I'm glad to see that going in place. Uh, when, and I think as we get to know more about this virus and how it interacts uh, and how it impacts, we'll have a better idea of how to confidently go back to work, go back to school, and go back to living our ordinarily social lives. But it's gonna take some work and we need to all pull together as we do this. Uh, it is my commitment as a state senator to ensure that our agencies deliver the services uh, that our, my constituents and Arizonans are entitled to. Um, I would also strongly recommend that those parents with children enrolled in schools check with your local school district or local school charter school as to how how they plan to start up. Every district in my legislative district 28 has a plan going forward. It's a careful plan, cautious plan. It's, it's getting more and more, each is getting more and more details filled in. While it's not so much children that are the risks, that are the risk apparently, we think. There are uh, teachers and employees who are older and who, whom we must protect. In addition, I think our hotspot will perennially be, until we come up with a solution or an end to this virus, our elder care facilities, our long-term care facilities. But what I want to say most of all is, please reach out to my office. I am happy to be of assistance. And again, thank you to One Main for providing this uh, service. Thank you very much, Senator, and thank you for all the resources you shared. As a reminder, for those of you who have joined, we're gonna be sharing those resources at the end. Um, and now I will turn it over to our first presenters, Allison Rappi with Brand with, and Brandy Smith with Arrowit, who will now discuss how to understand, manage, and rebuild your credit. Hello, my name is Allison Rapping, and I want to first thank One Main Financial for inviting us to be a part of this. We are really delighted. I want to spend a minute just telling you a little bit about Arrowette and our programs and services before we go into the presentation in case you or anyone in your family or anyone in your community may benefit from this. Arrowette was founded in 2011 to help women and their families who are impacted by the criminal justice system to be able to come out and live thriving, productive lives. We do this by offering programs, and we have four distinct programs that we offer that we would love to share with you. Our first is our Fundamentals of Freedom program, which is a really a three-part program that works with women when they're incarcerated. And then once they leave prison, we do intensive reintegration support for them, which includes case management, mentorship, housing placement, transportation assistance, um, access, trying to understand how to access utility or public benefits, as both the senator and the mayor spoke to at, um, 
we now have a number of public assistance programs that are available. Arrowet is very committed to helping women and their families navigate those complex systems. So please contact us if you think we can be of service to you. We also offer a number of workshops and learning experiences for women to successfully reintegrate. Our second program is an Arrowet Storytellers program, which is a program where women and their families are able to speak to community leaders and elected officials, business leaders, to talk about some of the key needs that women have when they are exiting the justice system. And so we are very excited about that program. Our goal is to train at least 50 storytellers this year. Our third program is a career center. We run a comprehensive career center and we basically help women with workforce development, job search training, interview skills, resume writing, mock interviews, career coaching, professional development. We also have a job placement program and currently we have over 30 job placement partners. Our goal is to help women find jobs in sustainable livable wage careers and jobs. Our fourth program, which really ties into what we're doing today, and we are delighted that we are a LISC Financial Opportunity Center. And as a financial opportunity center, we work with women and their families to help them meet their financial goals and realize, especially as we're going through this unprecedented crisis, helping them really recalibrate. So we do budgeting, career counseling, support, um, helping people find access to financial institutions and nonprofits such as Trellis or LISC who can support them. Um, so with that, I would really like to turn it over to one of my cherished colleagues, Brandy Smith, who's going to talk very specifically about rebuilding credit and share a really profound story with you all. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandy. Thank you, Allison. And thank you to One Main for hosting this event. And while we're waiting for the, the slides to come up here in a second, um, I wanted to give a little bit of background on this presentation. Um, so when we're talking about credit, credit seems like one of those things uh, for general public that, that everyone knows about, right? It's something that you learn about from a very young age. Uh, you understand how it works. You understand the things that cause detriment um, to your credit can hurt or help it. Um, so, as Allison mentioned, we do provide uh, a whole um, list, a portfolio of programming to women coming out of incarceration. And the reason why this particular topic is so important to me is because I was one of those people. Um, I am directly impacted by the criminal justice system. I um, spent almost uh, half of my adult life in the criminal justice system for a total of about 17 years. And it, it wasn't until I was recently released, uh, it was about three years ago, um, came out of incarceration <clears throat> with no understanding of how financial stability, budgeting, credit can really impact my overall life. I had never responsibly managed my money. I had never had a credit score. Um, and as, as I came to work for Arrowet and started uh, to have the opportunity to provide programming for these women, it became very clear to me that understanding basic fundamental uh, financial topics and information was going to be critical uh, to help these women come home from prison and stay home and be able to re reintegrate with the community, take care of their families, and be able to, to lead stable, prosperous lives. So that's a little bit of uh, background information on um, the topic today. The deck was originally created uh, for, for those folks, and I'm super excited to share with, with all of you today. Uh, we are, uh, Arrowhead is definitely committed to providing information support and services that are going to help you um, understand the effect credit can have on your financial future, and some tips and tricks on what you can do to help manage, rebuild, and really maintain good credit. So let's go ahead and get started. So everyone's familiar with their credit score, but really what's the point, right? <laughs> so obviously a credit score is a number, and but the number is what lenders use to help them decide how likely it is that 
that they will be repaid on time if they give you a personal loan or a credit card. Um, your credit scores built on your credit history ranges from 300 uh, to 850 and obviously a decent credit score is essential for your financial well-being because the higher it is, the less of a credit risk you are. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that affect your score, so let's talk about those. Next slide, please. There we go. So understanding how your credit score is figured can really help you manage it better. Uh, so let's talk about these, these five uh, critical factors and, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you how, how I learned uh, this lesson in a good way. Um, so starting with the smaller amount, so credit mix, um, people with top credit scores, they often carry a very uh, diverse portfolio of credit accounts. Um, it could be a car loan, a credit card, a student loan, a mortgage, um, other credit products. So a credit mix accounts for 10% of your FICO score. And then we also have new credit, and that's the number of credit accounts that you've recently opened. Uh, what also impacts that part of your score is the number of hard inquiries that lenders make when you apply for credit. So it's super important, especially for women coming out of incarceration as they're, start, they're trying to um, get their life started, that they don't um, overextend and apply for too much credit too quickly um, in an attempt to try and and get their, their financial, um, the financial part of their life together. Um, definitely too many accounts or inquiries can indicate increased risk, um, and then that can obviously hurt your credit score. <clears throat> so then with credit utilization, uh, this is kind of tricky. I, uh, I'm still learning the balancing act on this, um, but using more than 30%, back up please. There we go, thank you. Uh, so using more than 30% of your available credit is definitely a negative to creditors. Um, if you could keep it under about 30%, and it's 30% of overall. So if you have a, a couple of different credit cards um, to some different um, loans, um, then, then that's all good. But really credit utilization is more about credit cards and it's the average um, of all of your combined cards. And that does make up about 30% of your score. Now credit length is how long you've held credit. Um, that makes up about 15% um, of, of your FICO score. And generally the longer your credit history, the higher your credit score is. Um, but payment history, um, this is also known as payment performance. And this is the record that you've established by either paying or not paying your bills on time and is definitely the most important factor with a 35% impact. So uh, we'll hear, um, at the end of the presentation, you'll hear a, a great uh, thing about how credit impacted my life. But as I came out of incarceration and was building my credit literally from scratch, um, and, and trying to get a good credit mix and different types of credit cards and different types of loans, um, my payment history, even though I did not have very much length of credit, I it was brand new credit, but because I had 100% on-time payment history, then that indicated uh, as I was trying to, to get you know, loans and, and different things going, that indicated to lenders that I was, a, I was responsible and that I was uh, a lower risk for them to, um, to, to take a chance on for lending. So payment history is definitely the most important. Next slide, please. So now that you understand a little bit about your credit score, uh, you're probably quickly realizing that your credit score is definitely your most important financial tool. Um, it can definitely mean the difference between affording something you need or not being able to qualify. Um, your credit score doesn't really care what you earn, um, how well you pay rent or utilities, or how regularly you save. Uh, as you see here, uh, the difference in credit score of 100 points, right, on the same vehicle, $10,000 vehicle, a 100 point difference on your credit score will end up costing you an additional $6,200, right? Big difference. Um, so just kind of a great visual on how important it is to um, manage and maintain your credit responsibly because $6,200 is definitely a big difference when you're paying for something. Next slide, please. 
So the best advice for rebuilding credit is really to manage, re manage it responsibly over time. But it's okay. If you haven't done that, then you'll need to do some repair on your credit history before you're going to start to see your credit score improve. Um, there's a, the first thing you can do, um, you can um, fix errors on your credit history, right? Um, there could be things that weren't you, um, they were a long time ago. Um, so that, that's a real easy way to, to see a boost in your, in your credit score. But if we're going step by step, the first thing you do, need to do to rebuild it is create a budget and really stick to it. You need to understand how much is coming in, how much is going out, and really understand where all of the money is in your household. Um, and all, once you create a, bid, a budget, you also need to communicate with the people in your household so that everybody can not only support you, but stay on the same page and um, help um, better the, the entire household. Uh, the second thing you can do is request a copy of your credit report. Uh, very important. There are three different credit agencies. Um, you can get a free one, an annual free one every year. Um, make sure that you're checking it um, at least once a year. Uh, don't just leave it up to you know your your good luck and, and chance that um, nothing is going to pop up on your credit that maybe wasn't you. Um, you want to make sure that you are able to address that and catch that right away. Um, and then as we talked about before, correcting any mistakes or inaccuracies, inaccuracies on your report is going to be uh, an easy way to boost your, your score by, by several points. Um, and just avoid common mistakes and pitfalls such as predatory lending, um, payday loans, uh, those kind of things. Um, they might seem like a good idea at the time to to get you some cash up front, um, but really they are terrible, terrible financial mistakes. And then finally, just don't give up. Um, it takes time uh, to build your credit. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, there's actually no, qu no quick way to fix your credit score. Um, in fact, a lot of quick fix efforts are most likely to backfire. Um, so just be aware of any advice out there that says they can fix it overnight. Um, it, it takes time to do it. And I mean, just don't give up because it's definitely worth it. Next slide. So, how do I know all this is possible? Um, it happened to me. Um, like I mentioned, after um, spending over half my adult life in the criminal justice system, uh, with the help of Arrowet, I built my credit and bought my first house in February of 2019. Uh, so I know it's possible to start from scratch and put in all the hard work and uh, have it pay off for you. And um, I hope everyone has learned some valuable tips uh, about your credit. Uh, there's definitely many community resources out there, uh, just like Arrowet, who are dedicated to helping you build your financial future. And um, we can't wait to hear from you. And thank you again, One Main Financial, for hosting this. I appreciate it. Randy, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing that powerful and inspirational story and extremely valuable information. Um, that was great. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Croxon with uh, Ceci to walk us through how to handle a personal financial crisis. Great, Janine. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me uh, as part of the, today's uh, session. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess I'm going to start and finish um, with, with one theme for you. And um, this is the, the, the topic I'm going to talk about is handling a personal financial crisis. And, and what I would tell you is there really are four things to pay attention to. Um, the first is probably pretty straightforward, but you need to have a plan. And you heard that in the, uh, you can back up. We're not ready to go forward with the slides yet. Um, you, you, you need to have a plan. Uh, and you heard that in uh, Brandy's presentation previously. Second, really, really important. Time is not your friend in a financial crisis. Third, when you have a plan, you've got something to do. You can execute. You know what you're going to do, and you know what you're, you're trying to accomplish. And finally, um, if, if, you, if you don't know what to do or you don't, can't move forward, you need to ask for help. You can't be afraid to ask for help. So, so I, I want to try to put this in kind of practical terms uh, when you face a crisis. Um, uh, Ceci, uh, is Ceci Consumer Education Services is located in North Carolina and we've been in business 
helping consumers for 22 years, millions of consumers have come to us for assistance with financial counseling, credit counseling, housing counseling, bankruptcy counseling, et cetera. I mean, we, we, we help a lot of people throughout the country. Um, but here in North Carolina, we suffer every year from hurricanes. It's a dilemma that's, we, you know, we, we face this, it's going to happen. We know these storms are coming, right? Uh, and so you have a choice. You can respond when it gets here, when time is not your friend, or you can have a plan to deal with it in advance. And you may have to adjust things along the way, but you know what you're going to do. You know where your kids are gonna be. You know, you've got a strategy about how you're gonna handle things. And so uh, I, I use that example as a way to kind of think about what we face with COVID, right? Whether you have been directly affected and impacted today or not, the reality is that hurricane, that storm is still out there and it is not too late to make a plan and have a plan. Um, remember that time is not on your side. When something bad happens from this, you want to be prepared for it. Third, you, you really just need to act. It's sometimes hard to take that step, but if you do, um, you, you will be better off than sitting still. And finally, this is an opportunity to learn about resources. So if you need help, reach out. And, and, and whether it's in the Phoenix community or you want to work with someone on a national basis, there's lots of resources that are, that are there and can help you. So my task today is to talk a little bit more specifically, give you a couple of granular examples about how this can really play to your advantage. So this first one is have a plan. It, as it relates to personal financial issues, having a plan means having a budget. And um, I know that seems commonsensical, and I know that we've all been told, oh, I've got a budget, I know what it is, it's in the back of my head, and all. The, the reality is having a real budget is important. It gives you a complete picture of where, where your money comes from and, and where your money goes. And uh, so as a very practical thing, what, well, how do I do it? And you can see here on the screen, it, it really is starting with what, what are all the sources of money that I have? What are, what are all of my sources of income, whether it's uh, from a job or it's from uh, uh, some, some other uh, area, whether it's child support or government benefits or whatever, understanding and literally writing down what, what is my monthly and annual income. Next slide. So then we're gonna talk about, well, where, was, where does the money go? What do I really spend money on? And this is uh, a, a, an attempt to get a completely objective view on how you spend your money. And sometimes this is hard to do. Uh, again, this is the real value of having a plan and making a plan. This is hard to do in one sitting, right? You need to really think about where does my money go? Where do I spend money? Uh, and, and really write it down and track it. Uh, look in your checking account, look in other places. You, you know, there are lots of, of, of uh, uh, financial wallets on our uh, apps that will help you with this kind of work, but it, it's really, really important work. Uh, the next thing you want to do is wh wh what are my bills and what's the timing of those bills, right? Because you want to look at what are your expenses, but also when do they hit, you know, if they all front end loaded, if they all happen at the beginning of the month and you get paid in the middle of the month, you have to manage your cash flow in a very different way. So really being able to understand the timing of your expenses with when your money comes into your household is an important step in creating a budget. And then once you've got all that information, you really can create a working budget. You, 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 you understand what your expenses are, you under, understand what your, your income sources are, you understand the timing of both of those things. And then you can sort of say to yourself, okay, which of these things are essentials and which of these things are um, less essential, right? Because <clears throat> if you have to prioritize, there are certain things that you, you absolutely want to keep uh, as priorities. Your house, your food, you know, things that, that, that directly affect your family, medica medications, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So, here is a, a there, I want to give you a couple of specific examples of ways that you can deal with reducing your debt. If you find when you do your budget that you have too much outstanding debt, you know, how do you begin to pay that down? Because if you can't change the, the income piece of it, the revenue side of your uh, budget, 
how do you begin to manage the expense side when you know that you have outstanding debts like you heard about previously? You, 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 you've, uh, you've got credit card debt or you've got um, uh, student loan debt or you've got whatever it may be. This is an area where people tend to need help in focusing on how do I pay things down. Two very simple methods for, for, for paying things down. Um, one is the highest interest rate method, right? So let's say you have five debts, five credit cards. One credit card um, charges 21% and the other three charge 12%. Um, this idea is that you're gonna pay as much as you can on the high interest credit card first because over time it will cost you more on average than the other four. So paying it down first is a strategy for uh, eliminating longer term debt. Uh, you see here at the bottom, it may not feel like you're making as much progress, but you are eliminating your most costly outstanding obligation. Next slide, please. So another one that maybe you've heard about is, is called the snowball method, right? And this is focusing on getting rid of the smallest debt first. Uh, so let's say you're paying, um, you've got a $200 debt that you need to pay off uh, and you're paying $50 a month. So it's gonna take you four months to pay that off. Well, if you could pay it off more quickly, right? You take some of the money, you pay minimums on some of your other bills to pay off that $200 immediately. That means next month you've got $50 more to apply to one of your second debts. It's, it's really just taking, um, trying to pay off the smallest one as quickly as possible and then reapplying that to the next smallest one and then the next smallest one until you finally work your way up. This is really good because it helps people feel like they are making progress and see that they are making progress. And if that keeps you following your plan, that's a very, very important thing. You heard earlier the importance of sticking to your plan. This is one that really helps a lot of individuals do that. Next slide. This is the part about getting help. And, you know, somehow, um, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure whether it's because people are embarrassed or their situation hasn't gotten difficult enough. Um, I can tell you, you know, one of the most poignant experiences I had uh, in my long career here um, with, with talking with a customer was a woman who called me and, and she was incredibly afraid because she had been to her mailbox and her husband had gotten to the mail before she could and he was going to see the overdue bill and she was afraid that she was going to be abused and that's what it took her to pick up the phone and call and ask for help. Uh, I'm not sure why we let ourselves frequently with money get into this kind of situation before we will ask for help. But what I would commend to you is there are trusted nonprofit resources available to you whose only interest is in helping you solve your problem. And if you can't or don't want to or don't know exactly how to go through the steps of preparing a plan for yourself, I, I truly would ask you to, to reach out and, and, and get some help. Next slide. I think that may be my last one. So let me just wrap up by saying four things, right? There are four things to remember to avoid a financial crisis. Number one, make a plan. That's a budget. Number two, time is not your side. When the crisis arrives, whether it's the hurricane or the mail delivery or whatever it is, you need to have a plan and you need to be able to execute your plan. And if you need help, you need to reach out and ask for it. There are plenty of resources for you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that and agree 100%. It's very important to have a plan. Um, and finally, I would like to turn it over to our very own Joseph Millich from One Main Financial to show us what new scams he's seeing during the pandemic and what you can do to avoid being a victim. Thanks, Geneve. Um, again, my name is Joseph Millich. I'm a senior fraud investigator here at One Main. Um, and today I want to discuss some topics on fraud, scams, and in the era of COVID-19, more spe uh, COVID-specific uh, scams and ways to protect yourself against them. So um, first off, I'd like to give the definition of identity theft. Identity theft is a crime in which another person steals your personal information to commit fraud. 
So every year, millions of U.S. residents report that their identity has been stolen and used for various types of fraud. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me was millennials are more targeted using the COVID-19 scams. This is due to the fact that um, they're more uh, techno techno te like technology savvy, um, and that's the way they're, they're usually, uh, that's the avenue they're using to uh, perform these scams. Um, okay, next slide, please. So why are scams so prevalent? They're prevalent because they work and your identity is a valuable piece of information and identity theft and identity fraud are fast growing crimes. It has been the number one complaint among consumers for 15 years straight now. Uh, next slide, please. So not only do these thieves have creative ways of stealing your personal information, they also commit multiple types of fraud. That's why you should make identity protection a habit. It should be as natural as looking both ways when you cross the street. So these are a couple of things that scammers can do with your information. Um, if, they, if they obtain your personal information, they can open up bank accounts in your name. Uh, they can with their, withdraw money that's already in an existing bank account, or they can take out loans based on your credit history or information they obtain. Uh, next slide, please. So these are, these are some of the scams that these, these fraudsters have been using for a long time. Um, and in the wake of COVID-19, they're using a lot of these and manipulating them in, uh, in fashion towards COVID to exploit you for money or personal information. So we can start with the sweepstakes or lottery scams. This is where you get an unexpected, uh, unexpected prize or lottery scam. Um, this is... Um, Basically, when they ask you to pay some fee in order for prize or winnings that you never actually applied for. Um, typically, this is more susceptible, uh, the elderly are more susceptible to this, what I've seen in the past. An advanced fee scam is something of the same. It, it, it's a form of fraud that is most confident. It's a confidence trick that typically involves promising the victim a significant share of a large sum of money in return for a smaller upfront um, payment. So what this would be was something like, um, They'll reach out to you, send you an email, or you get a phone call saying you've won $10 million on Mercedes Benz and a trip to the Bahamas. All you have to do is pay the taxes up front. So when you pay those taxes, they, they tack on another payment, another payment until you're out of money. Um, a romance scam, um, we, see, we see a good amount of these. This is a confidence trick involving feigning romantic intentions towards a victim, gaining their affection, and then using that goodwill to commit fraud against them. Um, what happens next, they typically access the victim's money bank accounts, uh, credit cards, passports, email accounts, and the list goes on and on. Phishing, um, I'm sure everyone here in attendance, both uh, the presenters and the attendees have been the victim of phishing, uh, whether you give uh, information or not. Um, this accounts for 90% of all data breaches. And phishing is the fraudulent attempt to obtain sensitive information, such as usernames, passwords, credit card details, um, by disguising oneself as a trustworthy, trustworthy entity, um, usually in an electronic form of communication. Uh, next slide, please. So in wake of COVID-19, they use a lot of these tricks um, and they're manipulating to use, uh, as you can see below. So the stimulus phishing and text, um, this is where you get a, a text message claiming to be related to the government's uh, monetary help for people affected by the coronavirus. Um, and this is just, it's one of those things you don't want to click on. Don't click on that or any of the attachments because you could expose your device to some sort of malware or have your phone number added to one of the scam or fraudsters list. And the fake test kit sites and sales, um, that, that's exactly what it says it is. They're staging sites that look like real testing sites. And they're taking people's, either people's personal identifying information or they're taking a monetary payment up front. Um, the charity scams. The charity scams are they're just targeting generous people that want to help, and they're setting up fake charities or pretend to be existing ones. Uh, the fake cures and treatments, uh, this is where the fraudsters are peddling everything from teas to uh, essential oils to high doses of vitamin C, all with no evidence that they actually work against the virus. Um, and I, I'm actually located on the East Coast, but I looked into something that was happening on the West Coast here, and um, I, I saw the FDA approved at-home sample collection. So this means that you can, you can collect a sample at home and send it away to a testing facility. So what the scammers are doing in, that, in your location are they're trying to sell you fake testing sites and or kits. There's no way right now that the government or FDA approved at-home testing 
So both at home testing, you get the results. So that's what they're trying to do in wake of COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So ways to protect yourself against this. Um, when you see any of the below items is when there's cause for worry and you might want to contact either law enforcement, your bank, or seek other some kind of guidance. So one of them being unrecognized withdrawals from your bank account. Obviously, if you see $500 leave your bank account that you didn't authorize, that's definitely an issue and you want to contact your bank about it. And likewise, charges on your credit or debit card you did not make. Um, it's say if you have a credit card from Citibank and you're getting statements from Bank of America, definitely an issue. Um, debt collectors calling about debts that aren't yours is another issue. And uh, notifications of a data breach if you have some kind of um, a protection plan through, through some kind of credit karma type deal or something along those lines, that's something you're gonna to wanna to reach out to them about. Um, next slide. Um, additionally, um, there's some things. So if you go to apply for a car or house loan and your application gets denied and you believe that you should be approved for it, you might want to look deeper into this, possibly contacting the credit bureau or your bank to see if there's anything going on. Um, suspicious emails, text messages, phone calls, asking. That's along the same lines of the phishing type deal. Um, it, today is tax day, so if you see that you go to you go to file your taxes and someone already filed your name, it's definitely an issue. And the lastly, this is a newer one, a bill for, it, well, newer, more popular, I should say, bill for medical appointments or tests or even medications you don't recognize. This is something that's uh, become more and more prevalent. So you start seeing things from dentists or doctor's offices is something you want to look out for. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so if you have become the victim of fraud or um, you, you've sent money to these people, um, first and foremost, you want to stop communication with them. Um, and if you have sent any funds or any kind of information, just cease to do that. And then you want to tell your bank. Um, the banks have certain protocols where they'll help you out. They'll get you new bank account numbers. Hopefully they can seize some funds that you potentially sent over. Um, and then you want to report to law enforcement for sure. Um, you want to have this documented in case it comes down to a credit issue or trying to get some funds back. It's definitely important. You want a police report number associated with this. Uh, next slide, please. So additionally, you want to contact the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and, and this being that a lot of these fraudsters and scammers are, are set up overseas. So there's only so much our, our local law enforcement can do. The Federal Trade Commission, if they get enough reports, these incidents will step in and shut down some of these operations overseas. Um, uh, likewise, if, if, you're, if you have, if, if the fraudsters have a lot of your personal information and are opening up things like credit cards or have access to bank accounts, I would recommend contacting one of the three credit bureaus, either Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. And you can put some, it's called an extended fraud alert. And what that is, um, and, and a lot of the times these credit, credit bureaus will walk you through this, you can associate a contact number with your credit history. So if someone tries to open up um, a line of credit in your name, they first have to verify with the designated number that you gave to the credit bureaus. So it's a great tool to help you. And additionally, uh, it, you could also just freeze your credit altogether. If you're not, if you're not buying a house or a big, large item like a car, you could just freeze your credit and unfreeze at any time. If you freeze your credit, you know you're safe. No one can open up a line of credit in your name unless you open it back up. And I, I think that's it. Is there another slide? Nope. I'll hand it back over to Geneve. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate that. We have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to open it up to questions um, from the audience. And remember, you can type your questions into the question box, or you can also email us at communityevents at omf.com. So the first question that came in, I'm going to, um, I'm going to guess this is from Mike. And the question is, are there any apps you would recommend for setting a budget or tracking expenses? Um. You know, as far as the apps go, uh, I, there are so many. I, I, you know, some of them charge and some of them don't. I, I, I know that a lot of our clients use Mint. Um, and so um, that can sometimes make people nervous because it also attaches to your checking account. It keeps track of things for you. So um, I've never heard that being a problem for people. It's very good for man being able to manage a budget and your cash flow. But that does create anxiety for some people based primarily if you, what you just heard from Joe. I mean, some people get worried about that. But the reality is 
uh, it's, a, it's a very, very effective app and, and it works very well for, for many people and it ties a lot of the pieces together uh, and makes the budgeting process very intuitive. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is for Brandy and the question is, how long does it take to rebuild credit? So that depends on where you're starting. That's a great question. Um, for example, I know uh, folks who um, like are coming out of incarceration, they have zero. They have, um, when they go to get their credit score, it's literally a blank screen, right? So you're starting from zero. Um, so it's going to take time depending on where you're at. Um, if it's low because you just haven't managed it, managed it responsibly, um, then you can um, take steps, but I would say give it, um, you're gonna have to put some work into it. So a year, two years um, before you start to see really, you know, higher numbers in your credit score, I would guess. That's a great question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is for Joe. Joe, what should I do if a scammer or fraudster won't stop calling me? Uh, that's a great question. We actually get that one a lot. Um, Typically, if you've been the victim of fraud or a scam, they will keep reaching out to you for a week or two. If you, if you don't solicit it, it usually goes away. The best thing I would recommend is if you have a smartphone, you can block the number. Block the number. Sometimes they'll reach out to you from a new number. Block that one, too. And you can always do what I said. Reach out to local law enforcement or the FTC. But number one, just don't communicate. You might get some hassling calls, but they will move on to another victim if they know that you're being uncooperative. Yeah. Okay. Um, looks like we might have time for one more question. Um, let's see. And I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Brandy again. What, uh, if there's one thing you could, um, if there's one thing you could sum up from your presentation um, about how to handle your finances, how to alleviate debt, what would you say? Um, be patient. <laughs> uh, just be patient. Uh, stay the course. Um, keep your eye on the prize, whatever it is that you're wanting to do. So for me, I, w I wanted to buy my house. Um, and so it was easier for me to responsibly manage and build my credit because um, I knew what was at the end of that journey, right? I knew that there was going to be this great um, reward and achievement um, personally um, and for my family at the end of that. So just Stay the course, don't give up, um, and be patient. Yeah, and that's a perfect uh, note to end on. I want to um, say that it's been a pleasure to host this town hall. On behalf of One Main Financial, I would like to thank Mayor Gallego and Senator Brophy McGee for their leadership. And I would also like to thank our partners uh, and participants today, Arrowet and Ceci, for sharing this valuable content. And finally, I would like to thank all of you in attendance. Uh, and remind you that we'll be sending an email with all the links and all the resources to today's presentation. And thank you and have a great day.